But isn't it also the case that um, this assumption of normativity, whether it uh, you know is as as um, distant as it may be from actual scholarship, it it, it has been uh, used as a classification tool for scholarship up until relatively recently, right? Mm -hmm. You have a lot of um, there there has been, and, and I've we've talked to other scholars who say that there's a um, a stigma against studying uh, Gnosticisms uh, because they are considered less important or or um, or actually abnormal, right? Oh, very much so. I mean, um, when the uh, oh the five gospels book, the one produced by the uh, the Jesus seminar, mm -hmm. came out, and they had the audacity to include the Gospel of Thomas. <laughs> uh, people like um, oh. There are so many got so upset because how could this be uh, historical Jesus stuff, or how could you look at something like the Gospel of Philip as as historical Jesus? And I, I remember thinking, um, yeah, because somebody who you know brings back people from the dead is so historically <laughs> valid. And it, it just again, it's very much the um, the you know who gets or what gets to be normative tends to be what not so much what was going on then, but what happens to be important now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where before uh, uh, World War II and the Holocaust, uh, Jesus and Christianity was utterly against Judaism. Mm -hmm. Now, rightly so, we, we do not config configure it as such. It is Jewish, uh, to the point where scholars have gone through some serious mental contortions to make it seem as palatable uh, to, to whatever version of Judaism they happen to want to preserve or describe or invent. So, um, yeah, it really does come down to scholarly preference issues, um, whatever sort of agenda they have. Um, just recently there was um, a discussion on uh, Steve Mason wrote an article about saying uh, we shouldn't call it Judaism, we should call it Judean. And uh, the uh, brouhaha was uh, quite amazing where, you know, references to the Holocaust and Nazism <laughs> were, were bandied about and you're just like, you know, really? <laughs> so there is seriously something going on behind the scenes. And, and uh, I mean, I find that fascinating mm. uh, myself. But, uh, um, yeah, I, the whole normativity is, uh, I'm very suspicious when somebody tries to cast that in an academic setting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that just, it just sets my, uh, my alarm bells off. So. Yeah, well, bias is often invisible, right? Right, yeah, and I mean, I clearly uh, have my own. I mean, of mm -hmm. course, we all do. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, try to be aware that I have it, and and try to you know work through that. I mean, that's sort of the uh, the mantra, at least when I've been doing religious studies, when I've been trying to teach theory, is be aware of what you're saying. That it's these things are loaded and. Uh, they're not self-evident. I mean, normativity, Judaism, religion do not exist in the wild. They take a lot of work to produce. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, uh, biases are everywhere. Just be aware you have them, Yeah, I think. So would you say, uh, of the Dead Sea Scrolls, is there anything uh, among those documents that might be considered, um, that, that might contain some sort of Gnostic ideology or what would be described in the family of Gnostic ideologies? Yeah. Um, Again, assuming something called Gnosticism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I'm going to qualify everything I say. There's like scare quotes and all yeah. everything. <laughs> we'll just Photoshop uh, them on the screen there. Please, yeah. please do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, there certainly is some... Uh, I mean, nothing really overt. Nothing that would make me think, oh, somebody who read, you know, the hypostasis of the Archons would have got pretty excited by this. Mm -hmm. Um, that being said, though, we do have vaguely or, or kind of low-grade demiurgical texts where they talk about the rulers of the world and the sons of darkness and uh, the, 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 the kingless generation. Like these terminologies that feel very Gnostic-y have shown up. But then again, they show up in things like the Gospel of John. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I do think a lot of this stuff tends to... Um, uh, I mean, it's all breathing out of the same environment, so it's it's not surprising that you would find uh, some overlaps. Uh, their focus is going to be very different, though. I think the Qumran community would have been very um, distinct in what it was talking about or thinking about compared to 
the secret revelation of John, for mm-hmm. instance. So, but yeah, I mean, uh, there, it, it, I, I'd be surprised if there wasn't some overlap, but um, I'm pretty sure the one of the one of the uh, Yahadian scribes, uh, if he got a hold of uh, on the origin of the world, may have been a little, <laughs> uh, little uh, uh, confused to say the least, or would have thought it is a gross heresy, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> most certainly. Yeah, but then again, they saw the Pharisees as a gross heresy too. So, yeah. Um. Getting to the point of the show where it's not on the question sheet, and I think I read this somewhere, and maybe we could just edit it out. That point of the show was, was there something about about a treasure scroll or possible buried treasure? Or oh was this yeah. Just, yeah. No, I did want to include this because probably you know ninety percent of our audience are treasure hunters, so they'd be very interested to hear about this. Yeah. Yes, I I have got the scroll. I found the treasure, and it's in my office. Um, <laughs> And no, we have the head um, of John the Baptist. We have the head of John the Baptist sitting in the back. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I have it tied around my cat's collar. That's, uh, <laughs> that's right. Uh, yes, there is something. Oh, uh, it's like the, oh, what is it called? Yeah, something about this treasure. And it, and it sort of uh, uh, discusses. I'm not as versed on this one. I didn't find it as interesting as sort of the war scroll and things. But I have this special uh, treasure, whether it is. Uh, a real, you know, gold and silver and things, or, you know, this metaphysical treasure. It, it's kind of up in the air. I, I am probably not the best person uh, <laughs> to ask on that one. Because uh, I, I would, I sure hope there's some sort of, you know, at least we could make a good Indiana Jones movie out of it. Yeah. yeah. Something's got to be better than that last one. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're making another one, so they have another shot at it. Uh, oh, God. Uh, oh, well. Uh, He's not doing anything as Han Solo anymore. So. Uh, yeah, spoiler oh, alert. Spoilers. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. If you haven't seen it by now. Um, <laughs> I, I had another question that's not on the sheet, actually. Um, oh, is it easier to study the Dead Sea Scrolls because, uh, or the, Qum- the Qumran community because you have that kind of snapshot of, you know, these are the texts that they were using for this period of time? You know, and if the Qumran community went on and continued to evolve and, and write new texts and, and interact with other groups, um, their theology would have changed as, as every group does. So sure, is, yeah. it, is it easier to study the Qumran community versus another form of Judaism of, that, uh, of, uh, of their contemporary time period because that kind of continued on, whereas you have this little chunk of time here, time capsule? That's a really interesting question. I um, I've never thought of that actually. Uh, I would think, um, I mean, they would have been a little if they were producing their own texts, as as they seem to have done. Um, yeah, you would have had a better sense of who was writing what and when and where, and then you could have sussed through the agendas perhaps. But um, uh, yeah, the, I, I really I'm not sure. I I would think. My heart tells me yes. That would have been a little easier. It might not have been as interesting. Mm. Um, I the Judaisms that I've been interested in lately are the sort of uh, um, Alexandrian Judaisms where they had you know uh, the dead were used in their rites and things like that. Like some really weird stuff. Like I like the weird stuff. That's sort of been my um, that my draw into this kind of thing. So. Yeah, I want to. I want to do another show now on necromancy and Judaism. (laughs) I think I think you would get either a lot of positive hits or negative hits if you had that in the title. Either Uh, way, yeah, either way is good. With dead bodies, with Glenn (laughs) Perrin, I can see it now. Oh, there goes any career options I've ever had. Okay, (laughs) Um, yeah, I think the uh, uh, the Quran community seems. you almost get the impression that they were just waiting for their chance uh, at taking over the temple. Mm. You know, I, I always, I kind of think of them as that political party that just is waiting to take over. Um, they had the Pharisees and the Sadducees that sort of um, oscillated between them, but, you know, by God, we're going to get our chance. Uh, uh, that seem, maybe that's a very Canadian way of looking at it. We have multiple political parties, and we always have the one that's you know oh, never the uh, always the bridesmaid, never the bride <laughs> kind of thing. So I, maybe I'm I'm projecting a little bit, but uh, I think they would have eventually, if they carried on, they might have um, uh, either taken over the temple system uh, or been appropriated by other groups. Uh, I'm not sure how much they could have gone on on their own. These apocalyptic groups tend to. Uh, peter out after a while 
or get rebranded because you know when you're waiting for God to come fix right. everything and He doesn't show up. Yeah, you know, it's hard to it's hard to keep that tension. I mean, you see that with like Paul, for yeah. instance. He's, yeah, Jesus is coming back Tuesday, and then like seven years later, it's like, well, actually, I meant you know, and then they 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 change it a little bit. So yeah. A more recent example, the Seventh Day Adventists did a really good job of marketing that when they. <laughs> yeah, they're they're good. I think I like. Yeah, I have to admit, I'm uh, uh, seeing how they manage to pull stuff off is pretty good. So, um, yeah, I, I my guess is that the flavor of them would change uh, quite drastically. You might get something like uh, the Johannine community. How do you see with the Gospel of John and, and the letters? How that sort of evolved and changed, and then fragmented and and went on their way. So. Um, yeah, uh, the the what if in me thinks that they, I would love to have seen them become normative Judaism. That would have been pretty neat. <laughs> but then maybe but, they wouldn't have been as interesting. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. I mean, if, if the Apocrypha right. of John got to be in the uh, New Testament, I don't think uh, I would be all that excited when I get to read the Apocrypha of John. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what do you think, uh, what do you think happened to them? Do you have any personal theories or any academic theories that you like? Do you think the Romans wiped them out? Do you think there was a drought, or do you think they just went back to Jerusalem? Or I, I think they probably were a victim of the uh, conflict um, at yeah. the time, where Judaism or whatever the, the this thing that we talk about uh, was seriously under threat and under um, you know persecution by the Romans. Uh, so I think they either went underground or the community. You know, God's coming to fix the Romans, and oh crap, he destroyed our city. You know, like I think there was a lot of dark night of the soul elements uh, at that point where they would have to, you know, rethink how they're going to be Jewish, um, much like the Pharisees did and Christians did. You know, you know so maybe they got absorbed. Um, whether they were kind of wiped out by the Romans, I wouldn't hazard a guess. Um, uh, I'd like to think that uh, you know maybe they were somehow involved in the Masada thing or or something heroic and cool, but uh, I, I don't think um, I don't think we'll ever know. Yeah. All right, how's that academic for you? <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. Thank well, you, that is you. that is an answer we get talking to a lot of scholars. So that is. Uh, uh, we, yeah. we are slippery like eels. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, uh, I think uh, that probably wraps it up for us, Jonathan. Did you have any last minute questions? I, I think that's it. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you once again, Dr. Farron, for um, putting up with our, our technical difficulties <laughs> no, all this you. time, and, and we appreciate your, your time and your expertise on this, and thank you very uh, much. we look forward to the next time we get to talk to you about Marcia. Jeez, I hope that's soon. Yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, I heard that was going to happen pretty quick. Yeah. 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 So. yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, anyway, for those of you who are watching or listening along at home, we'll see you next week.